morning, family. These are your announcements. The Vine Life Youth Ministry will be presenting an Easter program on Sunday, April 9th. We would love for every child at the Vine to participate. Children and youth ages pre-K through age 17 are welcome to join us. Please register your child by visiting the youth ministry page on the website. The children will rehearse during the youth ministry class time each Sunday, so they should be in the back by 10.30 a.m. We will hold additional rehearsals on the last two Friday evenings leading up to Easter Sunday. Again, we would love for your child to participate, so please visit the youth ministry page on the website today to register them. True Vine family, there will be a ministry fair on Sunday, March 19th, both before service and after service. If you're not currently involved in a ministry, this will be the day for you to find one to join. We want everyone's gifts to be in use here at The Vine. This concludes your announcements for the morning. I'm going to read this morning uh, from Psalm 51. Psalm 51. And... Uh, <clears throat> It too is a very familiar passage of scripture. I like the tone set today. Deacon Lubin read a passage. Pretty lengthy passage. I started watching y'all's faces. And uh, I was delighted that no one seemed to get frustrated with the length of the text. That's a good thing, frankly. Just in case you didn't know, <laughs> worship ought to be more about praying, reading the Bible, right? And expositing the text. Amen. Praise songs. All this other stuff people do in worship, them just add on. I have no problem with them, but I have an issue when the adults become the priority. Are oh, y'all listening to me here? And so, I said I'll have to set you up for this reading. I'm going to read the entirety of Psalm 51. Amen. That okay with you? If it ain't, you'll get over it. Amen. Isn't that right? Yeah. Psalm 51 is a psalm that is perhaps one of the most familiar, famous texts in the Bible. Christians always find themselves going to it. Almost like, you know, John 3.16 text or what about that lovely one, Psalm 23. Psalm, psalm, psalm 51 is, is right in there. Especially anytime we think about the need for confession and the need for repentance. Which, let's be real, is something that all of us need. Isn't that right? Especially in this Lent season where we're doing our level best to connect with God. How many of you have joined us in our reading plan at the uh, Countdown to Calvary? How many of you have been just blessed by that? Yeah. Oh, give, give, give God a hand praise on that. But what, what I like about it is that constantly I'm reading about Jesus. Constantly I'm reading about Jesus. Reminding me that my faith is centered on Jesus, who is that solid rock. Amen. So I'm grateful for that. I, I like that every morning. To, to start my day off with reading something about him as he makes his way to Calvary to pay my debt. Not his, my debt. So in Psalm 51, uh, David uh, is, is uh, the author of not only this psalm, but uh, many of the psalms we find uh, in the book, uh, in the Bible. Uh, I'm reading it this morning from the English Standard uh, version and my Bible reads this way have mercy on me O God according to your steadfast love according to your 
abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I don't know about your Bible, but you know, I like to pay attention to grammar. And behind the word sin is an exclamation. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. And behold, you, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret hearts. Then he says, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear you hit here joy and gladness. Let the bones that have been broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, nor I, or, I'm sorry, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and in whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Lord, we thank you for the word now. You've allowed us to read. Hide the word, Lord, upon our hearts that we might not sin against and now God give us preaching power God give us clarity give us understanding break up the fallow grounds of our heart so that the seed of your word when planted would grow so that we might glorify your name Convict, convince is my prayer today in Jesus' name. People of God said, Amen. Amen. Let me take your seats in the house of the Lord. I want to call your attention from Psalm 51, particularly to the verses that begin at verse number 16. That's really where I want us to focus and hopefully take away from this preaching moment the idea of that brokenness is required if we are ever going to have a right relationship with God. Brokenness is required more than anything, we must come before God as peoples whose hearts are broken before God, whose spirits are broken before God, whose wills are broken before God. And I arrive 
at this place today, I'd like to tell you these things. I arrive at this place today because in my own life, in my own ventures, conversations that I have with people, especially in recent weeks, I have discovered that there's a dangerous thing happening among Christians. It is this idea that God loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And because God loves me, I can live, do and be anything I want to be and expect God to still love me anyway, which he will, but to still accept me and my behavior anyway. And so I stop by here today just in case in the church where I pastor, There's anyone who's under that false understanding of scripture. It is my job to be sure that you know what the Bible says, that your doctrine is predicated by what the Bible says and not by what your experiences are. Give me good. It is clear to me that there are folk today who claim Christianity, but when you look at their lives, there's nothing remotely that indicates that there has been an inward change. I'm talking about a literal, a literal, I'm not talking about figurative language a literal change on the inside. The old folk used to say that this won't let me hold my peace. It makes me want to live right. <laughs> this change makes me want to talk right. It makes me want to love my enemies. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Because it isn't what normally or naturally in me to love those who persecute me. But there's something that happened to me on the inside that allows me to forgive people who talk about me. It allows me to love people who I know don't care nothing for me. It keeps me from going down the wrong road when I know that I should be on that road. And if I should venture up on that road, it is, is that which is in me that helps me turn it around. Even when I'm feeling good doing it. It is that which has happened, that which has gone on inside of me. It is, it is, the power of God working in me. It is the function of the Holy Spirit who, who grabs me and, and shakes me, if you'll allow me to put it that way, and says, that is not the way that a child of God behaves. No, 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 no. It, it won't let me Go out there and stay out there for very long. A child of God cannot sin. Let me go on record unless I, you hear nothing else I'm saying. A child of God cannot sin and be comfortable. A child of God I'm not talking about somebody who goes to church. I, I'm not talking somebody who even been baptized. 
Though a child of God would do both, I'm talking about somebody who, who, who despite baptism, despite what, where they hold membership, they know God for real. And because they know God for real, when they sin, which we all will, they're quick to get right, church, and let's go home. They are, they, they are quick to do what is spelled out for us in Psalm 51. This psalm, friends, is written by David the king. Some of you may know him as the king. Others of you may know him as the poet. Some of you may know him as the musician. Others may know him as the great warrior. Some of you know him as a theologian, but he is David. Of whom the Bible makes clear, very few like him. In fact, the Bible says uh, 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 in 1 Samuel 13 and Acts 13, here's what it says about him, preacher. I know my Bible students will know it. The Bible says David is a man. Yes, sir. After God's own heart. Now, most folks, when they hear David's name, they automatically think of two things. Either of his what heroic act of faith when what he went to battle with the Philistine giant Goliath. We know him that way when he took what uh, five smooth stones and, and a slingshot and defeated the giant. Or we know David as the man involved in an illicit affair with Bathsheba. It's usually like that, isn't it? It's one or two of two it strings. David's illicit affair, you know, also led to what? Murder. Of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. And so what the Bible is clear about, and it's why I love the Bible, the Bible does not hide the flaws of its heroes. In fact, the Bible is clear, makes clear that David was not what a perfect man by any definition. And what did, by the way, when he sinned, he sinned in a big way. And yet somehow, in a way that only God can, when David finds himself in a dark place in his life, there is still an unlimited supply of God's amazing grace. available to him. I don't know about you, God, but, uh, friends, but that shouts me right there. Because David's story is not an isolated story. David's story, let me help some of you sanctified people, you holy rollers here. David's story is not just his story. His story is your story. Because the Bible says we all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. David's story reminds me of this reality. And here it is, friends. is that the struggle is real. That's right. That's right, friends. It, it, it's tough for a believer uh, who is trying to live his or her life according to the word of God. Anybody here testify? It's a struggle. It's not a piece of cake. In fact, if you won't agree with me, I'll just bring Paul to talk about it. Paul in Romans chapter 7, here's what he says. When I would do good. That's what Paul said. He said what evil is always present. He says, I have a desire to do what's right, but the ability to carry it out uh, is just not in me. That, that's what Paul wrote. Watch this, friends. Even though David wasn't perfect, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And I believe that we get the answer to why he is called a man after God's own heart in Acts 13, 22. Because not only does it say he was a man after God's own heart, but it gives you the reason why he was called that. The rest of that verse says, watch this, 
It says, for he will do my will. In other words, he will do what I want him to do. And you've got to understand the backdrop here. This statement about David being a man after God's own heart comes as a result of God what taking the kingdom from Saul who would not do what God what called him to do. Stay with me here. But somebody still can't understand how can this be true of David who in spite of his tremendous successes he had significant failures. Well, I'm here simply to report, friends, what the Bible says. And while David wasn't perfect, I suggest to you that he was a cut above the rest. Listen to me here. He was a cut above the rest, above the rest friends, when he, because what, number one, he operated in faith. When others operated in fear. You do recall, he was the only one. Willing to take on the what? The Philistine giant, but the rest of them were running for cover. He said, somebody got to defend the name of the Lord. David was a man after God's own heart because he was a man of great faith. But secondly, he was a man after God's own heart because what? He trusted God. He trusted God to deal with Saul, who would threaten his life. And watch this, friends. I like what the Bible says about him. Saul was threatening David's life and, and David could have snuffed out Saul. He could have killed Saul while Saul was slept in a cave. But David said, no, I'm not going to take this into my hand. I'm going to leave that to the Lord. Friend, I'm trying to tell you here that David is a man after God's own heart because he refused to take matters in his own hand and he trusted God to work it out. Do I have anybody listen to me here? Not only was he a man of faith and a man of great trust, but the Bible makes clear he is, David was a worshiper. Look at your name and say David was a worshiper. In spite of his what? Ups and downs. David was, was the man who never stopped praising God. It was David who wrote this familiar text, I will bless the Lord. At all times, his praise shall what? Continually be in my mouth. But what brings us to the text is this next thing about David. David was a man of integrity. Now that's going to mess some of y'all up. Where do you see integrity in David? Did not David sin against God more than yes? But David shows us that he's a man of integrity, friends, because he was able to admit his wrong. And take responsibility for his wrong. And that's, friends, what brings us to Psalm 51. For in Psalm 51, David makes clear that regardless of how far one has strayed from God's law, he can appeal to God for forgiveness, for restoration, and for another chance at living a life of joy and fellowship and service. If, don't miss me right here, I think I need to play that again because some of you were, were looking down. This Psalm 51 makes clear to any sinner, to any believer who has fallen, I don't care how far you have fallen, that the Word of God teaches that we can come to a God who is a God of grace, who is a God of mercy and we can plead to this God when we have what violated his law we can appeal to God for forgiveness we can ask God for restoration we can trust God to restore the joy of our salvation we can ask God to let, let us be a back one, one more time again in the fellowship we can to renew us to a place of service if don't miss me here not in spite of if his 
vitality, the abundant life that he saved you for. When you decide to come to him unbroken, admitting, that's what integrity is. Confessing that it's me. It's me, oh Lord. It's me, not my brother, not my sister, not my husband, not my wife, not my bad upbringing. It's me, not my church, not my pastor, not my economic. It's me. It's me, O oh Lord that have violated your moral law. It's me that have violated your spiritual law. And so all of these things become available when we repent, when we confess. Let me add this. And when we approach God, on the basis of his mercy. On the basis of his compassion. On the basis of his amazing grace. Did y'all hear what I just said? In other words, we don't get to approach God thinking that we deserve to approach him. Oh no. Oh no. I was on a long conversation last night with one of my good friends, and I tell you, one of the daughter's best friends, and she didn't love to talk, especially about the Bible. And she got my message before y'all did. She got to talk, and I said, look, I'm pretty soft at the one tomorrow. Let me just help you out right here. <laughs> I am so tired, and I'm so afraid. I, I guess that's what I really want you to get. I'm tired of it, but, but who cares about me being tired? I'm afraid for Christians who keep acting like you can sin. You can violate God's moral law. You can, you can disrespect God's plan for your life. And thank God's got to be happy with it. And thank God's got to bless it. In spite of no. David makes clear, and if I if I had the time, but I don't, I really want to make it clear right there. David tried that initially. When you read Psalm 32, David what confesses that when he was hard-hearted, when he knew he should have repented, but he didn't. He said, "What the Lord's hand was heavy upon him." He said he had no joy. He had no hope. He had question. You can't be a Christian and live like the devil and thank the Lord's hand. It's still going to be on you. Let me help you with something here. If you're living dirty all week long, ain't no amount of praise songs. Ain't no amount of what you stand up reading the scripture. Ain't none of that's going to help you. What's going to help you is to get on your knees and say, Lord, Because friends, it does not matter how flawless your performance is. At the end of the day, it's still a performance. It's not what God's after. This scripture makes clear that the sacrifices of God I'm almost done, y'all need to know. That the sacrifices of God are a broken, which means a crushed heart. Watch this now. A broken spirit. That is a spirit that agrees with God. That against thee and thee only have I sinned. That God, what I did is 
David's honesty and transparency. Uh, David, what, when he sinned with Bathsheba, when he took a man, another man's wife, when he committed adultery, in my mind, David sinned not just against God. In my mind, he sinned against Bathsheba. Because the truth of the matter is, she was a subject in the kingdom. And some people might argue that she had the right to say no, but not in that day. David's the king. And if David summons you to the house, guess what? You are subject to the kingdom. Hear me good. So David sinned against her. And then David sinned against the husband. He took another man's wife. And then what? When he found out she was with child, he tried to cover it up. That's what Psalm 32 is about. He said, look, I tried to hide it. I tried to cover it. But watch this. It didn't work. Everywhere I looked, my sin was ever. Before me. When I looked to the east, my sin was there. When I looked to the west, my sin was there. When I looked to the south, my sin was there. When I looked to the north, my sin was there. When I looked up, when I looked down, when I turned around, guess what? My sin was there. And I need to help somebody here. I'm going to talk the extra. Your sin, like David, is going to be there. I don't care what you do unless you repent. Of the sin and agree with God that we have violated his moral law. That's what David means when he says, remove my transgression. There are three words in this particular psalm for sin. Transgression, that is the word iniquity, and then there's the word sin. Transgression speaks of rebellion. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Come on, go on, go on tell the truth, shame the devil. Some of the sin that you and I commit, it ain't because we don't know about it. No, no, no. We Knowingly, that's what transgression is. That's rebellion. That is violating God's moral law. You are aware, but in your heart and in your mind, you said, I don't care. I'm going to cross the line. And then there's iniquity, which speaks of what original sin or the nature of sin. Iniquity is not so much about the outward rebellion as much as, much as, as it describes that which is within us. Mm. By nature. What, 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 what one writer said, and I agree, he said David is confessing here when he talks about iniquity is that what? This isn't just some isolated sin. He's saying what? That my very nature is tainted by sin. Sin is in me. And so he says, God, look here. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me from my iniquities. Deliver me from my sin. And that word is the word sin. The final word sin, as I said, what it really means is what? When you miss the mark. It means when you come short of God's requirement. I thought about this analogy yesterday to make sense. The truth of the matter is, uh, we all got some of all of it, transgressions, iniquity, and sin. And the truth of the matter is, watch this really. When it comes to, uh, to, 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 to that word missing the mark, don't we all miss the mark? Yeah. And you know the best example I can think of? Is that football just kind of ended, but, but you know, in football, watch this, in football, when they line up for a field goal, y'all know what a field goal is? When they line up for a field goal, the kicker will get there, and the kicker, his job is to kick it and have it go through. Everybody say the right. How many of you have seen this in any game, that the kicker will kick the ball, and the ball will be what? Directionally, directionally, directionally. It looks like it's going right down 
the middle. The team over here is getting excited because they are what, two points down, and if this happens, if this day, bad boy gets there, they're going to win the game. Well, get yeah, by one point, and it looks good. It looks, the commentator, if you're watching and listening on the radio, it's looking good. It's looking good. It's looking good. And all of a sudden, say, oh!
as I read these words, so search my mind. Not just verbiage. But search it in a way, God, that if you find anything in me that is, doesn't express brokenness, where you see pride instead of humility, Lord, clean that up. Where you see what self-righteousness instead of a dependence and a reliance upon the Holy Spirit to lead me daily. Lord, clean that up. Lord, make me more like you. He ends here. This is where I'm going to end. After he makes all those comments and then much more can be said, I said, in fact, this Psalm 51, you could probably preach a series that would last months. But after David requests all of these things, he says, I'm doing this because here's what I realize. That God, the only thing you're going to accept is not what? Ritual. The only thing, uh, uh, and it almost seems, let me see if I can just make this here. Watch this, watch this. In, in, in verse, in verse uh, I, I read 16, right? He says in verse 16, for I will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit and a contrite heart. It almost seems to contradict itself. In verse 16, he says that God doesn't delight in sacrifice. In verse 17, he says the sacrifices of God are. Well, what is it? Does God accept sacrifice or he don't? Can I flesh it out for you? It's clear, friends, that in Old Testament, right, God has always required sacrifice. Always. This is why what on a yearly basis they would bring to the priest. They're offering an animal. The priest would then sacrifice and sprinkle the blood. And so that they might have what atonement for their sins. We do that no more because now our one and only permanent sacrifice is the Lamb of God. Somebody ought to say thank you Jesus. The Lamb of God who does what? Takes away the sin of the world. And so Christ became our what? Sacrifice. So, 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 so a sacrifice is required to start <laughs> a relationship with God. What this text is teaching us is yes, it's required to start, but sacrifices aren't necessary, nor will they retain a right fellowship with God. What will retain a right fellowship with God once you have established a relationship with God is what? Here's what he told uh, uh, Saul. Look here. Saul tried to bring sacrifices in, in order to please God. But he said, oh, no, 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 no. Obedience is what? Better than sacrifice. And so come here, Christian brother and Christian sister. What I'm saying to us today is this. We, if you are a child of God, you cannot ever allow yourself to be bamboozled and to thinking that what, as long as you perform for God, you can live any way you want, as long as you give your tithe, as long as you show up the Bible study. Look at all that's just all, all that's just sacrifices. If none of that results in obedience, God said, I ain't having it. Take your little sacrifice back with you. Get it right before you come back to the altar. I'm done now. Somehow or another, I believe that Jesus, the Son of God, knew that it was going to take more than him just coming 
from heaven to earth. It was going to take more than him just healing the sick, feeding the hungry. While they were all good things, the mission was, do I have anybody listening to me? The mission, my brothers and sisters, according to scripture, was to go to the cross. And so he did not just settle for what acts or deeds uh, in his what earthly life, though they were good, though they showed him to be who he said he was. No, he went all the way to the cross. In fact, Isaiah said it this way, he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him, the chastisement of our peace was brought upon, and by his stripes we are healed. He didn't just talk it. He did it. Jesus, when he gave, watch this, Jesus, when he uh, uh, shared the last supper with his disciples before going to the cross, he said, take this bread. That represents my body. That was broken for you. Friends, he went all the way. What I'm suggesting to us today, these times we live in demand that Christians live not only lives of faith, Lives of trust. Lives as worshipers. But it demands perhaps more now than ever that we live lives of integrity. Where who you are on Sunday morning is who you are Saturday night. Where what you say you believe in your small group is apparent on your social media page. Now is the time, more than ever, that believers have got to realize that what's acceptable to God is obedience more than sacrifice. And if we want to be close to him, We've got to learn to admit that we're wrong. I hope when you leave here today, you don't leave here thinking that I suggested that you have to be perfect. We wouldn't be studying David if that was the case. But David shows us that you can get it wrong, but you can get it right. You can get off, but you can get back on. I talked to this guy the other day, he called himself a Christian. And this joke is just talking to me. I mean, I, I thought for a second, you don't even know what he's talking about. Telling me about the latest scam he was a part of. Where he falsified documents so he could get paid in a lawsuit. And I'm thinking, and you supposed to be a Christian? Do y'all hear what I'm saying? Christians don't act like that. And if they just, uh, you know, in the flesh, one time sign the document, sure they won't write about it. You know, I went to get my taxes done the other day. I got them done earlier this time. I was tired of, you know, Delaying the pain. <laughs> to my surprise. To my surprise. Right? The guy looked at me and said, that's going to be nothing. I said, what? Not an old taxes since I, Hector was a pup. And he's full grown now. He said, nothing. I said, what? We came out. So I get back to my office and everything. Lo and behold, I look in my 
uh, briefcase? Yeah, some papers. I forgot to get it. The struggle is real. For a moment, I thought was I'm good now. Yeah. I don't foul these times because I'm good. <laughs> but can I leave you with this? There's something in me that wouldn't let me do that. So I called him up. I said, I got a few more papers. <laughs> He said, send them over. We'll file a supplemental. I don't know how that's going to affect me, but at the end of the day, if it affects me negatively, if it costs me money, I'm all right with that. Watch this. Because I wouldn't have been all right. But what it would cost me is for his integrity and being a child of God and being able to stand in this pulpit and preach you ought to do this when I ain't doing it. I'm trying to tell you, friends, it matters in this day that we live in, that we come to God in confession and in repentance, knowing that God still forgives. Stand with me. Lord, how we thank you today for the word, how we praise you today, God, for it reminding us of you are more concerned about who we are than what we do. You are more concerned, Father, with us living holy as you are holy. You're not looking for a performance from us. You desire obedience in our inward parts. So God, like the psalmist, I pray that this morning the Holy Spirit has walked every pew, every aisle, and made clear to us, God, what is right in our lives as well as where we find ourselves out of bounds. Where we are out of bounds, God, we cry like David, have mercy upon us. Where we are out of bounds, God, we cry like David, create within us a clean heart and a right spirit. We want the joy of thy salvation to be restored in our lives. God, we thank you. I pray, God, for anyone here God, who finds themselves struggling with living according to your will, may they draw upon the Spirit of God who is their power source. May they understand today that they're right. They can't do it in and of themselves because the flesh works against the Spirit. But Lord, you said in your word that we ought to be filled with the Spirit of God. And so God, fill us afresh and anew Equip us. Help us. Lord, break our wheels and our spirits where they find themselves in rebellion to your holy word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Anybody not saved, God, save them. Thank you, God. Father, we ask all of these things now in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, Amen. Hello, friends. This is Pastor Cal. Thank you so much for joining us today in worship. I hope that you found the message to be a blessing to you uh, and your family. If you haven't subscribed to our page, can I encourage you to do so? That way, anytime we're alive, you'll be notified. I believe every Christian ought to be a part of the local church. And so if you don't have a church home, man, we would love to have you come and join us uh, at Team True Vine. In this time that we're living, friends, you don't have to be local to be live. You don't have to be local to join us as a member. Go to our website. The link is provided below. You'll find more information about our church 
You'll also find there the platforms that we have if you'd like to give financial support to this church and to this ministry. We love to have you. We are the warm, friendly church where everybody is somebody and Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you again for your time. Hope that you'll come back and join us the next time we are live. Until then, friends, go with God and he will go with you.